Okay, uh, welcome to the session of the Dynamic Coalition on Blockchain Technologies, um, where we will explore um, the status of blockchain governance uh, and uh, its implications uh, for the use of the technology, good, bad, or otherwise, um, for uh, purposes of social good. I have uh, with me a panel of uh, five esteemed uh, speakers. Um, the first to my left is Pindar Wong. Pindar Wong is the chairman of Verify um, LTD, a discrete internet financial infrastructure consultancy. He is an internet pioneer who co-founded the first licensed internet service provider in Hong Kong in 1993 and leads the Belt and Road Blockchain Consortium. In 2015, he helped organize Asia's first blockchain workshops, Scaling Bitcoin, uh, Dot org and sponsored the Hong Kong Bitcoin Roundtable. He also serves on the Hong Kong government's Committee on Innovation, Technology, and Reindustrialization, and as a director of the Hong Kong Applied Science and Technology Research Institute. Um, to his left is Maria Gomez, um, who is currently the head of ecosystem development at Aragon One, and, and also a, a Colombian trained lawyer. Uh, to her left is Primavera de Filippi, who is a permanent researcher at the National Center of Scientific Research at the University of Paris II, a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, and co-founder and co-director of the Coalition for Automated Legal Applications, also known as Koala. To her left is Rick Dudley, who is a blockchain architect and uh, is one of the folks behind many of the most important or biggest uh, DAO uh, projects. And to his left is Constance Choi, who is also the, the other co-founder uh, and co-director of uh, Coalition for Automated Legal Applications um, and um, leads uh, Seven Advisory. And we'll begin with comments from Pindar Wong. Thank you very much, Carla, and, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I was asked to provide a, a sort of very high-level view of the, uh, the rainforest uh, to help prepare and provide some context today. And so what I'd like to do that is really talk about uh, the sort of the Bitcoin or blockchain hype in general, uh, the hope and in some sense the reality, and to, to try and give some language and thoughts around which to reason. So first of all, uh, you probably all heard about, um, you know, Bitcoin exists as the very one, it's almost 10 years now. There are other terms that are being used like blockchain technology or distributed ledger technology, whatever is politically correct. Um, but you're probably hearing it everywhere you know, in, so, in a sense that, you know, blockchain can do lots of things, uh, or even though we may not be very accurate in terms of what we actually define as a, a blockchain or what is actually the innovation itself. Um, if we look at the genesis behind this, the language of money um, is really very, very powerful and what we can express with that. So if we go back to 10 years ago with the invention of, of Bitcoin during, or just after, well, during the great financial crisis, um, it's been 10 years and that has evolved to many other 2,000 different cryptocurrencies and now uh, other kinds of blockchains which are involving smart contracts like Ethereum and basically the idea that not only can we financially fly, we've invented that sort of Wright Brothers moment, uh, but also that it can be used for many other things. So the hype is certainly there. and I'm, I'm personally a little bit um, confused. I think the hype is overdone, um, and this is, again, just my opinion. I look forward to what I call the blockchain winter, uh, very much like the dot-com boom. It's kind of very frothy, but then after the sort of the, the froth was taken away, the real work continues, right? The tide goes out, we see who's uh, swimming naked, so to speak, and the real work gets done. So with respect to the hype, um, I think the real thing to take away here is that we can now design incentives, um, obviously financial incentives are the, the easiest one to understand, in a very, very granular way. And so there are different fields now which we either call crypto economics or token economic, token economics, which means that making money now is literally a command line, <laughs> right? We can make money enter. So the, the language or the monopoly on the creation of money as a very, very powerful tool has now, it's now all software and it's out there. And so now what's very great about it is that the Cambrian explosion in, in, in thinking about um, not only incentive structures and all the ways that we can design and build community networks, for example, but also different ways of restructuring society as we continue to digitize everything, not just financial access. So. Moving on to the, the hope here is, uh, I like to say that uh, no one is above the law and no nation below mathematics. And it's kind of ironic that we say, uh, say that in this context because 
you know, the United Nations and the sort of uh, the, the world of law and borders is sort of the, the Westphalian view from 1648, right? Whereas on the internet, uh, we are now post-internet, we're on the post-Bitcoin world, but we don't really care about law and borders. We are, everything is about topology, not geography. And it's important to understand that the underpinning and legitimacy of the technologies in which we will organize society are not necessarily legally based. Right? It doesn't rely on legal certainty, which has a law and border, but rather, and I try to use this as, a, as an example, it's based on this stuff. Right? This, is, this is a physical lock. Right? And so it's, it's a different kind of lock because, you know, assuming no one has lock cutters in the room, it doesn't matter what you think. If you know the combination, you can control the asset. And so this is a sort of uh, replacing or complementing legal certainty with a notion of cryptographic certainty or minimally cryptographic consistency as a new way of, of solving the problems which are washing up on our shores, uh, which require us to cooperate at global scale, at a scale we've never seen before. The SDGs in terms of uh, are there, the 17, climate change, it's quite clear that we have a technology which is different. It doesn't respect borders. As I said, Bitcoin exists. But the internet of trust, which is the theme of today, is really not uh, something that jives with me entirely. I, I talk about, since 2015, the the Asia-Pacific Regional Internet uh, Governance Forum, the notion that's actually an internet for trust on a trustless internet. You know, we have to now assume the internet is trustless, but connecting the internet now, there is a calculus. Before, it would be very clearly good to connect to the internet, but now if you connect to the internet, you know, geography is forever on the internet. Everyone's your neighbor, and everyone potentially can be a bad neighbor or bad neighborhood, right? Cybercrime, cyberspace, et cetera. So there are new tools in our policy toolbox, which we need to have. And I ultimately think that whilst there's a lot of hope and whilst I say there's a new East Falia which relies on the provenance and transparency this technology provides, that there is something which can be grounded. And that is that there is potentially a new social construct which we can create using this technology. And that is why I think it's very important to recognize that currency is a starting point. We have these DAOs, we have uh, smart contracts and maybe sort of a Rousseauian new smart social contract. But what this technology can actually do is provide a new governance technology, a governance technology for nation states where the border does stop. And for all the global problems now that require coordination, cooperation at scale, my, I think the optic I would like to leave you today is that this is ultimately a governance technology and how the governance of the blockchain technologies uh, to have that discussion is very important, and I think that's starting today, and my other panelists will contribute. Thank you. Thank you for starting us off. We'll turn now to Primavera uh, to pick up the thread. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to actually perfectly continue on, um, on one thing that I'll say, um, I think one thing that is really important to understand is that nowadays we have technology which is actually outpacing the capacity for governments to actually regulate those new um, internet infrastructure, whether it is because we are talking about those multinational corporations that are actually too big to be regulated by one single nation state, or because we're talking about those decentralized networks that are actually transnational by their nature and therefore cannot be regulated within a jurisdictional uh, framework. And then the other thing to understand is that at the same time, technology is actually an important proxy for change. Um, and the question then is how do we actually manage these technologies and how do we actually, if they cannot be regulated in the traditional sense through like a governmental intervention, then how do we actually manage, administer or self-govern those technologies in order to ensure that they're actually promoting the social good? And um, and then if we look at the way in which power and governance has actually evolved over the last 20 or even 10 years, then we can see that power is actually changing hands constantly. And so the question now is whether blockchain technology is actually providing those new avenues for new organizations of power and new government structures, or whether it is actually simply taking power away from existing structures, but then it's actually reconstructing the exact same framework, perhaps even just like recreating or reinforcing existing power structure, just that it's a new type, typology of actors that are taking this power. And so then 
if we look at the, the potential of blockchain technology, then we can see that there is indeed an important potential for emancipation, for uh, um, greater amount of freedom and so forth. But at the same time, because those technology are escaping from the traditional rule of law, then you cannot enforce, you cannot ensure that those technologies are being used for a particular purpose. And so because of this capacity that blockchain technology has to reformulate power, then it becomes extremely important to actually look at the question of the governance of those technology in order to ensure that power is actually being properly redistributed because if the, if the underlying premises of blockchain technology is that we are providing this decentralized infrastructure for decentralized governance and decentralized power, then we need to make sure that there is no, no possible of like reconcentration because the actual decentralization of the infrastructure does not necessarily lead to a decentralization of power over this infrastructure. And so we have those common problems known as the tyranny of structurelessness in which when you have like a decentralized organization that doesn't have a formal structure, then oftentimes you can see those new elites and those new like invisible powers which emerge, which are much less accountable because no one can actually see who is really making decision, who is actually having the power and therefore people cannot keep them accountable and there is therefore no, no transparency on the actual decision making process. Um, and then the second thing is that in the end, the, the devil is always in the details. And so it's very easy when we have a new technology to actually see all the amazing potential and the new opportunities that the technology provides in theory. Uh, but the problem is that as we start implementing this technology, then we actually start seeing the details and the details is where the actual problem emerge and that's, that's the only way we can identify them. And so most of the hype today around blockchain technology is because we are thinking about this technology in theory and obviously in theory it has enormous op opportunities and potentials but in, in the way it has been implemented so far then this is only on there that we actually see the flows, be not because of the technology as such but because of the way in which it has been designed and the way in, in, in which the government operates within those networks. Uh, and we have seen uh, interesting examples, um, uh, specifically when something is, be is being created and then uh, there is a technological design of how a particular system should work and then at some point we might realize that it doesn't work as intended, uh, that there is a bug, that there is like a flow in the actual design and then the question becomes if it has been codified into the technology then what, how can we operate in order to modify it? Like, if the, if the technological governance fails, then what kind of non-technological off-chain governance can actually uh, jump in in order to modify the protocol, in order to change the code that is actually operating this network? And so this is how all the discussions around the need of actually reflect around the governance of blockchain technology has emerged and this distinction between on-chain governance, which is uh, governance by the infrastructure and off-chain governance, which is governance of the infrastructure. And so basically to conclude, like the, the, the ultimate uh, idea is that governance by the infrastructure is really just an enforcement tool. So it's about baking into the fabric of the technology a particular set of rules, but then the question is always who defines the rules that will be baked into the technology. And this is a process. This is not something that can be automated by technology. This is something that requires human organization and human consultation and deliberation in order to then enforce those rules through a technological tool. And so to, to reiterate what uh, Pindar said about like we do, we do need to create this kind of a new layer of trust on top of these trustless technologies. And this is obviously a social construct that requires uh, very in-depth thinking about in terms of governance. Thank you. Rick, would you like to comment? Yeah, sure. Um, <coughs> so I, I have some, some notes on things that I think um, sort of ideals that are held in the, in the blockchain community that um, are aligned with um, the, the development goals. So I, I, I think that just sort of a little preamble, um, a lot of people in the blockchain space are very um, anti-government or very libertarian, um, but ultimately, I mean, obviously I'm just speaking my opinion, but 
but ultimately, you know, libertarianism sort of lacks a robustness, right, as a model. I mean, it's it's not a full model for governance in many regards, um, and so y you have to, in practice, you end up with de facto governance. You end up with de facto rules to make up for the parts of the philosophy that didn't actually map to reality, um, and and so um, so th so you know, these notes are more about. Um, Sort of how do you sort of bridge that difference? How, there's, there's, you know, there's the sort of the blockchain view on one side, which is in some regards a very much optimistic, some sort of fantasy, and then there's actually building things that actually solve people's problems or are actually useful. Um, so for me, um, the, the one of the ma major value propositions of blockchain technology, and in particular, I mean, obviously exemplified with with Bitcoin is the right to exit, right? The ability for you as an individual to not have your work um, be bound to some large arbitrary institution that you effectively have no say in. Um, and, and so this is an ideal that I think many people um, outside of the blockchain space can appreciate. And I think that you need this uh, right to have people leave and enter social groups in order to ha in order to solve complicated problems, you can't just be burdened or stuck with with people who don't want to be there or don't want to participate, um, sort of mucking up the system. Um, w in a similar vein, um, you know, sort of the counteract that we also need a meaningful concept of privacy in the contemporary uh, telecommunication environment that we're in. So, um, you know. The, the ability for a dictator or some other sort of person to exert uh, an unfair hegemonic influence on, on a small group of people is enormous um, given how you know, contemporary internet technology works. Right? I can monitor all of your communications, I can intercept messages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a big part of the blockchain community's goals are, are to create privacy in particular around economic transactions, but again, because of the libertarian slant, which I think is a little narrow, there's, there's an emphasis on uh, economic privacy, but, that, but blockchain technology more broadly can provide that same type of privacy to any other type of uh, interpersonal transaction. Um, I also think that, that um, you know, one of the problems, again, very much a personal problem, but I think does reflect uh, the broader community, um, we have organizations of hundreds of millions of people, and and then we sort of pretend that that we're all aligned. I mean, I'm here in in, in Paris, and you know, I'm an American. I didn't vote for Trump, right? I, you know, I don't I don't think he represents in many regards a mandate of the 300 plus million people in America, um, and so at some point. I think, you know, if we, and then also, I mean, celebrating, you know, the, the end of World War I, you, you can have these, these, these countries of 40 million people or 10 million people, but that is categorically different from a, from a systems perspective than 100 million people. And I, and I think that really 10 million people is probably too many. And so I think what a lot of the, the value of blockchain technology and, and, and applying cryptography, uh, in particular signing messages, um, what, applying that technology to these sort of uh, contemporary social problems, what it allows us to do is it allows us to, to self-select groups, for us to create groups that are not geographically bound, groups of people that are based on interest and in, in shared goals, and then coordinate those groups in a secure way, um, you know, for the, for the betterment or achievement of the, uh, of, you know, of these goals that, that were discussed. Um, so I, I think that ultimately there's a fear, I think, well, I mean, there's there's a large marketing influence in how blockchains are discussed. People are marketing, they're selling something, and I think in selling something, you know, uh, in this particular context, you know, we're, a lot of people were selling freedom, uh, you know, the, the freedom to commit crime, maybe, as opposed to the freedom to escape persecution, right? Which I think is an equal, or frankly, more important um, um, freedom. To preserve. So, um, yeah, that wraps up my comments. And Constance, I think you're going to pick up there. What I have to say speaks to you know what what all all of the people up here have been talking about. You know, I wanted to just kind of reframe this in in terms of. 
what we see as the promise of blockchain, which is this global infrastructure that is to um, allow us to have a common shared state of things in which we can coordinate and organize and count different things. And then we have, on the other hand, the sustainable development goals, which really speak to a shared space, um, this idea of a shared planet, resources, uh, a floor beneath which we won't fall so that we can all rise as one humanity. And it seems on its face that these things converge. Um, but what we've been seeing in the development of the blockchain space, and, and it speaks to how our understanding of what blockchains can do as infrastructure is changing from you know, these isolated monetary systems to more global systems of coordination and governance. Um, what we're seeing is actually, um, unfortunately, s some playing the same, the same game with, with these new, very powerful tools. So I can give you a few examples of that. Um, you know, uh, the, um, uh, you know, early on in the space, you saw a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs and early pioneers that really talked about the potential of blockchain, the narrative of, you know, lowering remittances, um, increasing capacity to participate in global financial networks being put forth. But what these guys were actually building were new systems, new financial systems with even more intermediaries than before. So instead of having just the bank in the middle, you have a bank, the blockchain exchange, your wallet company, you know, the network fees, and so on and so forth, which is quite ironic. And then, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've seen in the blockchain space is the promise of the failure of, of our government institutions or, um, you know, as a response to, um, you know, our, our, our understanding now that, that democratic processes have been hacked has been actually solutions that are reactions but still are, are operating on the same logic. So you can see this in various examples. Um, you know, the, the rise of nationalism, for example, is, you know, really the other side of, um, uh, you know, a, a culture of fear and exclusion and othering, which is a very old game. Um, you can also see, um, you know, the, as a response to kind of the hacking of our democratic processes, you know, an increased shift into uh, a faith in algorithmic governance, data-driven policies that actually um, take away the agency of people. Um, and then you can see solutions that are put forth, so things like, um, you know, radical markets. So this idea that, you know, we will do away with property, that uh, everyone on a, on a free market basis will be able to bid for services. Um, you know, that ignores the structural uh, power issues that, that people ha don't have the same access to resources or capacity for decision making, um, which means that these systems will inherently fail on the same basis. And then, you know, you have other promising uh, solutions. So you have the E-Estonia, um, the, the Estonian E-Residency Program, which reformulates, on one hand, this idea of governments competing to be service providers. So on one hand, that's, that's really promising because for the first time you have government institutions who, whose confidence has been eroded by the people um, trying to serve their constituencies better, but you see a kind of a subtle sleight of hand, which is instead of a, 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 almost a philosophical reforming of the relationship between the state and the people, instead of um, you know, governments owing duties and rights to its citizens, what you're seeing is the reformulation of governments or these virtual nations uh, providing services to consumers, which is inherently an exploitative frame. So, so what we're seeing actually are these technological tools that hold great promise and great power being used to recreate some of the same systems and accelerating the inequalities of that systems. Um, so, you know, I think that all of us here who have been working really deeply in the space see how this can be a fundamentally powerful tool for a fundamentally different game. But, um, but in order to do so, we actually need to come from a different kind of consciousness. So, um, you know, we need to use these tools, this infrastructure, to build more complex systems that um, do things like um, provide greater agency to people, um, that increase our capacity to not only make decisions, but um, develop sense-making tools that allow us to make informed decisions, um, to build, you know, even closed-loop supply chains, for example, that take into account externalities that then give heft and weight to this idea of a common shared space. Um, you know, things like com coming from a more compassionate point of view, understanding that 
but for you know an accident of birth, you could have been born in one country or another, and that um, that we really need to have systems that enable people from all walks of life to be able to participate. Um, so, you know, the one a phrase that I heard recently just really struck at me, which is that, you know, the idea of the people is an idea; it's a concept. Um, the individual, though, is a person. So as we are building this infrastructure, as we are using these tools to create new, new kind of communities, um, using these, this, this blockchain to be able to increase our capacity to organize, to coordinate, to, to literally count different things, things that we value, um, that we need to constantly ask ourselves, is this increasing our, our ability to, uh, to inform and increase our capacity for agency on an individual level? And is the narrative that's driving this idea of the community or the people inherently one that is based on a consciousness that isn't exploitative, that's actually communal, that actually can, can speak to the promise of this technology as, as a borderless and non-rivalrous means of being able to coordinate as, as a whole. And, and there's a, a lot of projects that are experimenting with these new ways. Thank you. So um, first Pri Rivera and then Constance both spoke of the way this technology could be used to recreate the same system, but uh, Maria, you're working on uh, building a, an entirely different system. Can you tell us about that? Yes, um, so uh, my idea is to present um, the project I work for as an example of how we're using this, this uh, set of new te uh, tools. Um, Aragon, Aragon is, is a project that has two parts, and one part is well building an application, and it's more like a, a platform where you will go, you download, and, and you will see different applications and, and different templates, and you can use those templates to uh, create your organization on the blockchain. Um, and so anyone can download that application and use those set of applications for free, uh, it doesn't matter where they are in the world. Um, those applications are, for example, the finance application for projects to or communities to manage their budget in a transparent way. Um, the survey application for, for these open projects to give a voice to their communities and uh, regarding certain decisions or all decisions. Uh, the voting application uh, as well. And in the future, we will have different governance applications like um, liquid democracy, uh, future key, and any project, any community can use those different applications according to their needs. And the other part of the project is what we call the Aragon Network. And that network is going to provide services to the organizations that opt to join that network. It's totally... Uh, um, uh, voluntary, so people that want to join can join that network to find services like um, the decentralized court. So the idea of the network is to provide a, a framework for the different decentralized organizations uh, to interact among each other, to transa commercially transact in a, in a trust-minimized way. Um, and so Another service is um, the, the decentralized court. So if something happened, um, there will be a court that will be studying whatever the problem that happened and will be solving that issue according to the rules of the network. In the network, we do have a manifesto. And that manifesto uh, has the principles of the of the of the community of the Aragon community, and such principles are like, for example, decentralization of power, and this is something that we are in the process of of doing. Um, so we raised uh, a set of funds for the building of this project, and we want to give the power of over those funds to the community. Um, we have something that is the Aragon governance proposal, and right now we are going to enter into the voting process uh, uh, as of tomorrow. So token holders, uh, people from the community that have uh, Aragon tokens, they can vote on whether we should adopt that proposal, that governance proposal. 
um, and that proposal set the framework for the decision making of the uh, decisions regarding the, the, the use of the funds, for example, and also the governance of the association. So the legal part of the of the project is a is a legal association that um, is a legal entity that is in in Switzerland. Um, um, what else? Another another principle is non-violence. So, like I said, uh, whoever wants to join the network can join, and whoever wants to to um, opt out of that network can do it as well. Um, self sovereignty So that means that the user, everything, the data, and and all the power is going to be in the hands of the user, and we respect. We are going to respect privacy a lot. We uh, we will love to have anonymous organizations and anonymous people participating in, in participating in the in the network. Um, and yeah, this is this is. You can go to to Aragon.org and 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 see um, th this project in 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 real life. How all the different things that we are trying to do with a different set of tools. Maria, who do you see using the? Yeah, so that's a good question. The the right now the first um, users of of Aragon are pr technical projects, projects like us that are building network decentralized networks and that are building on on open uh, open blockchains. But uh, our end user we call we call we have a persona and we call it Maria. And this Maria, she lives in Colombia or in Venezuela, in these um, um, countries that um, are very corrupted and that where people don't have a lot of opportunities, um, like like people that are born here in, in Europe. And so we would love that Maria to use the, the network so she, for example, can work for one of these organizations and earn in, in crypto. Uh, or she can set up a, an organization with different people in the world uh, to do certain things, to, to build a network, to build an application, to build a website, and, and get paid uh, for that work. So before I open it up to questions and comments from the audience, I wanted to give the panelists a chance to respond to each other if you have comments for each other. Yeah, come back. I'm just struck by the language that we've all been using in both the philosophical ideas, et cetera. It, it just shows you, again, the whole thoughtfulness of the people who are currently involved with the space and some of the very complex, not only ethical issues, but political issues that everyone are, re are wrestling with in terms of the design of this effectively software. So the thought that uh, sort of I have, or one of my questions is, you know, are we replacing institutions with software? Because, right, again, we're losing the geographic view, right? Now you can choose which economy. You can have an economy without borders, right? We've got crypto token. You can join any community you have. You have the language of money within that community that is recognized. You have political systems in terms of agency and how representation is. We ha I've heard the word court, right? We have openlaw.io. We've got simulation of law, law uh, and, and, and contract and smart contracts. So it's, it's just kind of, uh, it struck me that, you know, this is a very pivotal time to have thoughtful people, again, everyone in this room, to participate in these discussions. I think none of us are particularly qualified to deal with this harass, but we can all contribute. Uh, but the freedom of thinking in terms of these 2,000 different you know, cryptocurrencies, all these different blockchains, really strikes to me as a sort of Cambrian explosion of the potential that people, people will see. But without your participation uh, in these discussions, it's not clear how it's going to land. And if we don't land it, you know, decentralized doesn't mean disorganized, right? We can contribute and we can shape things. So I'm looking forward to the comments. Um, I, that all sounded good to me. That's that's most of my, my comment. I, I don't think that we're ultimately um, replacing institutions with software. I think there are people, I think what is happening is people have are in the process of trying that and it will fail, and then they will realize like, oh, institutions are made out of people, um, and now I have to deal with people, unfortunately. I, and, and, I, and I think that that's sort of the, the lesson that 
I mean, there's a Bitcoin cash fork. I mean, I don't want to get all inside baseball -y here, but I mean, a group of people who were like, we're going to split off because of governance issues. We're going to eliminate governance issues. And like three months later, had a governance crisis. I mean, it's like you, you can't avoid these problems um, in spite of really, really wanting to. I, I totally agree with you, and um, that's, that's a key thing that we always have in mind. Um, when I was talking about the network, for example, uh, that network is going to have a set of rules uh, on the smart contracts, but also we want to, like, when organizations are transacting and entering in, into an agreement, we, we want um, the rules set in uh, in a smart contracts, but also we want to have like a like an agreement. It, it, it doesn't mean a, a legal agreement, but an agreement, a human readable agreement, because these organizations, even though if they are going to be running on on software, they are made of humans as well. So we cannot put all these different issues that can, can come up on 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 code in code. We cannot codify everything. So we want to set up this agreement, human readable agreement, to, to, to talk about the intentions, uh, at least. And I think to, to add to this, I think there is an in interesting distinction that can be made between um, tools, technologies, and then processes or institutions. And I think that there is this kind of initial attempt, at least within the blockchain community, of taking the technology and providing tools that have the ultimate goal of actually replacing a process. And uh, I think this is inherently doomed to failure. And of course, the technology and the tools can affect the governance structure and can affect the governance process. But in the end, you still have a process, and the process is a process between different actors and people. And this cannot be replaced by technology. And I think it's, it's actually very it, it's, it's a useful distinction because, because it enables us to see here is the process that we are un unhappy with or that we want to change, and then here are the technological tools that we can use, not in order to get rid of this process and just replace it with a technological thing, because then it's static and then it doesn't evolve anymore, but rather what are the different mechanisms and tools and devices that we can create in order to transition and in order to Im improve the transparency or whatever the, the, um, the outcome of this process while always focusing on the process and not on the actual technologies itself. And I think we have the, the great benefit of the lessons of the internet. You know, Pindar was there from the very beginning and you can see how a system that was supposed to be global and um, democratic um, quickly became very, very centralized. And so how do we build into these kinds of technologies and avoid the same perils um, and avoid this entropy towards centralization? How do we create these feedback loops that make these systems constantly resilient to this, this kind of entropy? And to go uh, with, uh, with Primavera as well, um, the, the tools are, are like the way the way we see it in Aragon. The, t the tools are the means, um, and so for example, we also think that these tools that we're building can be used by by the institutions. Imagine uh, a budget uh, running on on a finance application on an open blockchain, like a, like a budget from from a, from a state or from a government. Uh, so we can see what what is the decisions that are. Um, being made around those funds and how these persons are, are the persons that are in power um, are using those funds or, or yeah. Um, I think the tools that we are now creating are going to be very important to, to you know, to use them as, as, as a way of check and balance of, of the centralization of powers that we have today. So now are there questions from the audience? And we'll start here in the second row. Hello, um, my name is uh, Jörn Erbgut. Uh, I'm uh, researching at the University of Geneva. And thank you very much for your statements. Um, I, I agree that, um, well, 
replacing current governance by blockchain doesn't work because blockchain has not resolved its own governance problems yet. And resolving the governance problems of blockchain is not easy. As we see with uh, our democratic society, we are researching for centuries to find the best way to govern a democratic society. And we're still not there yet. We have models that work, but they are not perfect. So it, it's no wonder that uh, blockchain governance uh, still has to evolve. But I, I see a big potential that if we achieve good blockchain governance, we can offer something to society to be an enabler for decentralized governance. But in order to be able to do that, we need some kind of legal frame. Because um, we ha blockchain is not operating with, uh, um, well, blockchain is not unregulated. Blockchain is heavily regulated by lots of laws that maybe are not applied yet, but they are there. And we need some kind of a, a protected space for decentralized governance. And we need to define the rules, uh, legal rules, the legal frame of this protected space, like uh, we have it in uh, the New York Convention of Arbitration. So meaning that if decentralized governance will stay within this frame, it should be protected against legal intervention. Thank you. Um, we, we highly invite, encourage you and invite you to join one of the initiatives that we've, we've started, which is um, called A Legality. And it's all about exploring the space between these code-based systems and physical systems governed by laws. So what we are trying to do is build a translator, a gateway, um, whether and, and figuring out what forms those may take in order for these systems to operate within each other, to interoperate. Because people are deploying these systems. And these systems, as you say, have a, have effect on the real world. They may control real property in the world. They may um, enter into contracts with human beings that are governed by laws of the real world. They are subject to jurisdiction. They, they are, they are uh, non-jurisdictional. They operate in this global digital space. But as soon as they touch the physical world, they operate in this kind of bordered Westphalian um, borders. So uh, what we are trying to do is actually build that bridge so these systems can communicate to each other. And I think also to your point, you know, people often, the governance within blockchains is, we are discovering very rapidly in the last few years, is not about on-chain governance, these rules, self-executing rules. They're really about all of the social processes around those rules. So, uh, you know, people often conflate, for example, decision making as governance, but actually a large part of governance is sense making. So the things that happen before decisions are made, uh, the things that, ha that decide who has skin in the game to be able to participate and make decisions. So um, well, we are, we're, we're constantly trying to interrogate this and we would really, we'd love to, to, to you know, invite you and others who want to participate and, and help inform this discussion because there's certainly been a lot of scholarship that we can learn from. Thank you. My name is Firdosi. I'm a researcher from Università di Barcelona. Uh, some of the point is already been made by the previous person who asked the question. Uh, so, for now, maybe just for the basic, uh, when, from the technical perspective, when something goes wrong, yeah, when we applying the blockchain, who will take the blame? We'll take the blame, and then just the prison, yeah? So from the case uh, now, wherever it is, maybe in Europe and whatever, is how usually do you solve the problem? So this is kind of the thing that uh, maybe from the law and then from the regulation, we, we will come with the solution because like, uh, there is a different mindset between when you learn the social science and then the natural science, and then I also interested with how the regime of intellectual 12 property works for blockchain so far. Do you have maybe like uh, as we are like the people who involved there, are there many uh, critical or maybe I don't know uh, feedback that maybe towards WIPO on how they should react in regards with this uh, blockchain technology? And uh, last but not least, uh, do you think that uh, given how the, because I, I, I hear that uh, some, there are some panelists feel like 
you don't want that the blockchain to be treated the same like how the cyberspace were in the uh, in the past. They have the cyber libertarian and cyber paternalism, but in the physical, it's always like people are more likely because the way we uh, humanity works for so long is by applying law, and law usually is always involving certain institution who uh, in uh, who responsibility with that. So. Yeah, I mean, this will be complex, but uh, do you think that maybe uh, standard ethic or do you think that there will be like a certain type of uh, institution, like maybe, I don't know, international organization which uh, conduct the blockchain and so on, because maybe it's a, I don't know, I think if you just randomly put it in maybe uh, in WIPO, in ITU and then so on, maybe it will be like misleading somehow in the future. Thank you. I'm happy to answer <coughs> some of those questions. Um, I'm not going to necessarily answer them in order. Um, I think generally, uh, sort of, we call them crypto native people who are, have basically grown up in the blockchain. Uh, they're not going to agree with your last point, your your last idea of the creation of institutions. I mean, I think that they would basically uh, reject that concept out, out of hand. I, I don't know that, I mean, you know, you end up with de facto institutions, you end up with de facto processes. Um, but the formalize that I think would sort of undermine, um, it's, just, it's, just not a, it's just not a model that, that, that is compatible with that type of formalism. Um, you asked another question about who's to blame uh, when, when systems fail. Um, and, that, and that one sort of perked my interest. Um, so I, for me, there's uh, just in life, there's this important difference between blame and responsibility. Right? You can point a finger and say, you know, this metal was faulty, um, that's why this bridge fell, but there was someone who was responsible for testing and build and producing that metal, um, and there's someone responsible for installing it, right? And so there's a difference between like the blame and the responsibility. So maybe both. But yes, I so I'll, I'll address both. Um, I think uh, one of the benefits of the blockchain space and the sort of, um, and this will tie into your, you had a question about IP law, right? Yeah, so to tie into your question about IP, because the technology is fundamentally open source, and we'll get back to that, um, it's very easy to blame people. You can say, this person wrote this code. I mean, you can see there's a, there's a public log of everyone who committed the code. Um, now, maybe those people are synonymous, so maybe it's user 47 uh, made this error, or maybe it was, you know, Tom of, you know, New York made this error. Um, but you can see, uh, you can see who, who made the errors. Um, Oftentimes, uh, the responsibility um, falls primarily on the individual to to be aware, which is which is obviously a bear, uh, an enormous barrier to adoption, right? I mean, you need to be very technically sophisticated to be aware that these vulnerabilities that have been exposed and that there's an attack ongoing, so on and so forth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then I would think the next people who tend to take responsibility um, are the developers. So the, the, the core developers of a protocol or the providers of a tool that has a vulnerability in it, they, in the way the community exists today, oftentimes even in a synonymous context, for whatever reason, um, you know, maybe game theoretic economic reasons, it's just, it's just you know, it, it supports their greed to take responsibility, uh, you know, in the worst case. But oftentimes people feel some sort of social obligation and, and core developers take responsibility. So I think looking at, I mean, the DAO is probably for, for the people on this panel, the DAO hack is a, is a very salient example. I think there's probably more recent examples that might be maybe more more relevant, but but in the case of the DAO, um, the actual people who deployed the code, uh, frankly, took a relatively limited amount of responsibility, and the people actually operating the network, who really technically had no responsibility, uh, took on that responsibility to provide a solution, and there was questions about the governance that went into that, how, you know, the, the how did they decide, and, and, and how did that process go? Um, and so I, I think that that, um, that sort of gives you some context about the contemporary uh, environment. And I think that um, for me, at least, as uh, someone who was interested in these sort of philosophical questions before the Bitcoin paper was published, I, I would like there to be um, some sort of, uh, we were talking about this word the other day, some sort of technocratic uh, process where everyone is educated Right? I mean, you know, this is a fantasy, right? I mean, this is like a great Greek fantasy, right? Everyone is educated, everyone is participating in governance, and, and because we all have that base of knowledge, 
we can make intelligent decisions collectively. Now, of course, that's not going to work. I mean, there'll have to be delegation and there'll be social games and social proof and people will be manipulated and, and uh, as they are in the world today. Um, but, the, but the goal is, is to have a system where everyone can be, everyone who participates in the system can be educated in what the system is doing and the system is open and transparent to facilitate that. And I think I covered three of your four questions. So I, I, oh, I'll go back to the IP question. So in terms of IP, again, um, for me, uh, all the work that I do with my clients um, is all open source. So instead of having an NDA, I have sort of the opposite. I say, in a year from now, if you haven't published the results of my work, I will. Um, and, and there's other people in the community I know who are consultants who have also fairly aggressive um, open source requirements for the work because the, the purpose is to, again, provide knowledge to a community of people who will use the knowledge, not to enrich um, someone who has the capacity to, to file a patent. I, I filed a patent, I have a patent, it's expensive, it's difficult. The, the purpose isn't to, to con continue that uh, system. The purpose of developing blockchains is, again, to allow large groups of people to self-organize and millions of people to form collective groups of tens of thousands of people. And I, I'm sorry, there was a third question you had in there that I don't remember. Can go to you? Okay. Yeah, um, I, I did. Uh, in terms of the first one, both the blame and responsibility, just a reminder that these are in some sense very cold technologies. Which is the point, right? If you have the key, you know, if you had the, if you know the combination of this, you open the lock, and if the lock's faulty, what have you, you have problems. But the blame game is, in some sense, right now. I think where we are is that it's actually your responsibility, right? Because it's the the, the choice is all there, but the transparency might not help because it's in code, it's what have you. The learning the, the learning bar is very high. You have to be technically sophisticated, but that will hopefully come down with time. Uh, but yes, right now, that's kind of where I think we are. It's cold, and in some sense, it's 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 the opposite of the law, right? Where you have the the intent. So how these two will relate to each other is, is going to be very very curious in, in the weeks and months ahead. Has there been a, a case, like legal case, on the misuse of blockchain, like by blockchain? Ap by applying the traditional law? I mean, like maybe the there are no like law about blockchain number blah 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 or something like that but uh, I was wondering if there has been case that people bring the case where it involved blockchain to the court and then so there on. There actually and has been. Yeah. So there's a um, lawsuit uh, represented by uh, David Miller of Silver Miller uh, in the United States. It's a class action lawsuit against the Nano core developers for failure to rest and fork. It remains to be seen uh, whether it goes forward or not, but the lawsuit has been filed, so, so that's one to, to watch. There's also an argument emerging in the United States, at least, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm a fan of the argument by any means, but there's an argument emerging around um, places to place fiduciary duties on participants uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, and again, I'm not particularly a fan uh, of the, of the uh, argument, but, but there is a discussion around that emerging. Um, you saw the, um, a former commissioner of the CFTC make a, a comment in a speech uh, in Dubai recently um, that uh, if you could be held responsible for, quote, illegal smart contracts if you reasonably knew that they would be used uh, in an illegal fashion, right? So there is some emerging discussion under existing laws around where you can place responsibility. Um, where all of that falls out, it, it's not entirely clear. There's also a slightly different approach, which is actually to use the existing system to protect what has evolved. So you have people like Blockstream doing defense, defensive patent strategies, or in the case of, for example, Bitcoin, using IP, which is patents which have actually been expired. So, for example, the use of Schnorr Schnor 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 signatures, if I get that right, in the iteration of the technology ahead. So it's actually, it's, it could be using the existing system to sort of, re not reverse hack, but to provide a clear safe space within which to innovate. And you'll see actually in terms of uh, uh, what ha who is responsible when things go wrong, you're seeing actually a lot of innovative approaches. So one of the things that Aragon, for example, is working on is creating a court that has jurisdiction within the code-based rule of DAOs. So 
um, these DAOs would um, submit to jurisdiction by this digital court, and it would be kind of an alternative dispute resolution that exists only in the digital space. And then another form might be, and this is something that a lot of blockchain companies are exploring with, is um, what happens when a smart contract goes wrong? Um, does it automatically trigger uh, an alternative dispute resolution process in the real world or address redress to the courts in the real world? So one is just within the digital space. The other is um, if something goes wrong in that digital space, a, a, a availment of, of uh, remedies in the, the physical space. And then what we're also discussing, we just had a, a really great discussion last week and also last night about this, is could we, because uh, these systems inherently and, these, and this infrastructure inherently has a different architecture than the one that the existing laws contemplated, could we somehow create a mapping of a one-to-one -one equivalence so that we could have a functional equivalence of certain things that operate in the digital space that would be recognized in the law in the physical space? So this, you know, of course requires a lot of uh, work and mapping and translation and education and buy-in, but that is also another, a third way that people are dealing with these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, in essence, I think uh, we need to really think about what are the public policy goals of laws and um, how can these be achieved in a technological context or if not, what kinds of new legal structures do we need to be able to accommodate for these things? And we've, we've seen this before on the internet and um, you know, there are, there are precedents for how we approach these problems. And we need to just keep on iterating and innovating on that. Great. We do need to exert moderator's privilege. We have a question from the remote participants. It's from Maria. Um, they want to know how decentralized is Aragon Network? How many people decide on rules? And can they move with the decision without the core code contributors? Yes, um, so it depends on how many, how many, the people that can contribute or can uh, vote is the people that hold a Aragon network token. Um, so that depends on that. Um, and also, yeah, I mean, the idea is that the decisions are going to be taken by, by the, the community of, of token holders, uh, regardless of what the, the um, core developers think. However, um, because this is very difficult, so we are starting step by step. So for example, I was talking about the Aragon uh, governance proposal, um, which is which we are presenting like the decision making process that we um, would like to have in Aragon and the community is going to decide if, if they, if they, we opened that proposal um, publicly like more or less a month ago for people to, to, to contribute as well. And, uh, and now we are opening for vote for um, the token holders to vote on whether they accept it, yes or not, or they reject it. And, um, and uh, that, that uh, proposal, it's, um, you know, it, it, those decisions that are going to be taken according to that proposal, they have sometimes, if the decision is like very key on, 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 on whatever happens with the project, um, the, the, uh, the association, which is the legal entity that is the owner right now of, of the project, is going to have a better power. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the, the questions. This is actually the end of our time, but we would uh, be delighted to continue discussing. We invite you to join the Dynamic Coalition on Blockchain Technologies and engage in our work, um, and uh, hope, that, hope that you'll contribute on an in ongoing basis. We do the work year-round, uh, so don't let the discussion stop here. Thanks. <laughs>